My topic for today is the Women's Health Initiative, Long-Term Study Outcomes and an Update. Before I go any further, I should point out my disclosures to you, but all the information I'm sharing with you today is my own work. Before we can go forward and look at what's happening now, we really need to go back and see why we could be bothered with the Women's Health Initiative. And those of you who were in practice at the turn of the century in the 2000s will remember that from 2000 to 2010 really could be called the Women's Health Initiative decade. There was a flurry of publications which began in 2002 and has kept going ever since. And if you look at this slide, you could see that all but one, the one on the left-hand side with the asterisk, delivered bad news. It was bad news for women, it was bad news for doctors, and it was bad news for those who thought hormone therapy was a good idea. Subsequent to that, we've had a significant revision, really, of that initial data, where the authors of WHI themselves have come to recognize that some, in fact, many of the things they said initially were not correct. And as a consequence of that, we developed a range of guidelines, um, and I know there are some in Malaysia as well, to help us to learn how to practice hormone therapy in the safest way. And I've listed them here, but the one I want to concentrate most on today is the simplest one. It's the revised global consensus statement on MHT, which was published in 2016. It's about three pages long, it's easy to read, it's easy to understand, and in my opinion, it's still relevant. These were the key points. One was that MHT is the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms. The benefits, and, uh, the benefits are greatest and the risks are least. If you initiate in women who are in the period, that quality of life and other menopausal symptoms may also improve with MHT, that MHT reduces the risk of osteoporosis and related fractures at the hip and the spine and at other sites, that it's effective in the treatment of symptoms of vulvovaginal atrophy, and that estrogen may decrease the risk of coronary heart disease when it's initiated within 10 years of the last period. The data on estrogen and progestogen shows a less compelling trend. In my opinion, probably because synthetic progestins were mostly used in the trials which we examined. There were some negatives. The risk of thromboembolic disease is increased with oral MHT. The risk of breast cancer, whilst rare, is increased with long-term use and equates to an incidence of around about one in a thousand women per year and is related to the use of a progestogen and perhaps to duration of use. So since all of that, there have been, I suppose, a hundred publications from the Women's Health Initiative. Even if you go into PubMed and look at what's published this year, you will find an endless stream of papers. But I would like today to focus on four very important ones. First of all, the 2013 long-term follow-up data, then the 2017 mortality data, and the 2020 most recent publication by Rowan Schlabowski, looking at breast cancer incidence and mortality with long-term follow-up. But also in 2020 was published a review of the Women's Health Initiative itself in the journal Menopause of the, the Journal of the North American Menopause Society. And this was really a review of everything that had happened up to that point. And these were their key statements. For those of you who don't know, there were 16,608 women who had an intact uterus recruited into this trial, and they received conjugated estrogens with MPA, medroxyprogesterone, or a placebo for a median of 5.6 years. There were 10,739 women who'd had a hysterectomy who received estrogen alone or a placebo for a median of 7.2 years. And now both of those cohorts have been followed for a median of 18 years. 
the ov overall population, which had a mean age of 63, demonstrated that neither intervention prevented coronary heart disease or led to a favorable balance of chronic benefits and risks. Now, if you read that sentence again, you can see that negativity that pervaded the original WHI publications creeping in again. Neither led to a favorable balance. But in fact, I can tell you, neither led to any harm either. And then they go on in a more positive note. More favorable effects were seen in women under the age of 60 or within 10 years of their last period. And then, excitingly, in younger women who entered the trial of estrogen only therapy with an oophorectomy, the intervention was associated with a 32% reduction in all cause mortality over long term follow up. So, for the appropriate women, it was pretty good. And the conclusion of the authors here was that systemic MHT has an acceptable safety profile for menopause management when it's initiated amongst healthy postmenopausal women within 10 years of their last period. Pretty good, really. So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. These were the cardiovascular outcomes, looking at the intervention phase and all patients. If you have a look at coronary heart disease, myocardial infarction and coronary revascularization, you can see that there is no significant change in outcomes for either group. So neither arm um, of this study, including all women of average age 63, caused any harm in cardiovascular terms. However, if we look at thromboembolic risk, there was an increase in pulmonary embolism and DVT, and that increase was greater for the women who used conjugated estrogens with MPA compared to the women who used estrogen alone. The risk of ischemic stroke was increased similarly in both arms. But if you look in the green rectangles that I've just highlighted, you can see that the absolute numbers per 10,000 women per year are actually very small. What that shows us is even if this, even in this group of women who were older than we would normally treat on average, 63, very little harm was done, even if we used conjugated estrogens plus or minus medroxyprogesterone acetate. Let's have a look at the cancer and other outcomes. You can see up the top that breast cancer was increased by conjugated estrogens with MPA, but not by estrogen alone. In fact, there was a strong trend to a reduction in risk. Colorectal cancer was reduced by the combined therapy, but not by estrogen alone. Fractures and diabetes were reduced significantly by both interventions. And gallbladder disease, as you would expect, was increased by both oral interventions. Probable dementia, hard to say. Perhaps there was an effect of the addition of MPA there, but certainly no effect of estrogen alone. And if we looked overall at the women aged 50 to 59, then again, you can see there is no increased risk of anything in the intervention phase of the Women's Health Initiative. No increased risk of heart disease, myocardial infarction, stroke, PE, breast or colorectal cancer, mortality from cancer. Manson and her colleagues tried to put that together in numbers. And they looked here at the total number of cases of something per 1000 women over five years. And you can see that the oral combined therapy increases coronary heart disease, stroke, DVT and breast cancer risk. That oral estrogen increases VTE risk, but actually improves everything else. But once again, look at the numbers. They're very small. So MHT is a very safe intervention. We also know that the addition of a synthetic progestogen attenuates the overall benefits of estrogen, as you can see here. And then, as I will talk to you about later, the choice of progestogen, the age at initiation and the mode of delivery are all important. 
Let's have a look now at the 2013 long-term follow-up. And I'm talking here about women aged 50 to 59. And you can see that there was a reduction in coronary heart disease and in myocardial infarction risk for women who used estrogen alone in the green rectangles. There was no increased risk of coronary heart disease or of MI for women who used combined therapy. There was a trend to a reduced risk of breast cancer for women who used estrogen alone, nearly but not statistically significant. But there was an increased risk of breast cancer for women who used estrogen with MPA, and that was statistically significant. But look at the VTE stuff. For women aged 50 to 59 with long-term follow-up, there was no increased risk of thromboembolic disease. That became statistically apparent amongst older women. If we now look at the menopausal hormone therapy and long-term all-cause mortality data, which was published in 2017, you can see highlighted in green at the top on the right, there was no change in all-cause mortality. The formal statement is on the left. Amongst postmenopausal women, hormone therapy with estrogen and MPA for a median 5.6 years or estrogen alone for a median 7.2 years was not associated with any increased risk of all-cause cardiovascular or cancer mortality during a acute bottom on the right in green. And you can see the risk of death from breast cancer was reduced in those women who used conjugated estrogen alone. And I mentioned earlier on in the study about the women who had had their ovaries removed at the time of their hysterectomy. And I just wanted to remind you of that now. Women who had a TAH and BSO or a THA, TAH and a following subsequent BSO before the age of 65 and who were younger than 60 years of age at the time of randomization to this trial and received estrogen alone had a reduced risk of all cause mortality. The hazard ratio was 0 0.6. That's a 40% reduction in all cause mortality. And that segues quite nicely into Rowan Schlabowski's paper published just last year, looking at breast cancer incidence and mortality during long-term follow-up as well. Now, if I showed you this slide and said, what is it? You would probably all say, it's the slide showing breast cancer risk from the first couple of uh, publications of WHI data, but it isn't. It's the 20 year follow-up data. And what you can see is that there was a reduced risk of breast cancer with long-term follow-up for women who used estrogen alone. And there was an increased risk of breast cancer with long-term follow-up for women who used estrogen with MPA. If we dig down a bit deeper into that, the use of estrogen was associated with a hazard ratio of 0.78, statistically significant, which translates to about five fewer cases of breast cancer per 1,000 women after 7.2 years of use. But importantly, as I've said before, a lower risk of breast cancer mortality. There was no effect of prior MHT use. And the authors went on to say, these are the authors, I might add, that in 2002 said, you better stop because you're all gonna die of breast cancer. They then went on to say prior use of conjugated estrogens alone is the first pharmacological intervention to significantly reduce breast cancer mortality. Quite a turnaround. Of course, if we look at the data for conjugated estrogens plus MPA, it does show an increase in the risk of breast cancer. The hazard ratio was 1.28, and that translates in absolute terms to about one extra case per thousand women per year. And I, I encourage you to use absolute terms when you're trying to explain this to your patients, because they don't know what a hazard ratio of 1.28 is, and they never, and they shouldn't, but they will really understand 
one extra case per thousand, that's as bad as it gets. And importantly, this data again showed there was no difference in annualized breast cancer mortality for women who received estrogen plus MPA or placebo. The risk was greater for prior MHT users, and it was greater for women with a gap time of less than five years. So if I was to summarize that data so far to sit where we are, long-term follow-up has shown no increase in cause specific or all cause mortality from either intervention. For women aged 50 to 59 using estrogen only, there was less heart disease and there was less breast cancer. For women of all ages using estrogen alone, there was reduced risk of death from breast cancer. For women aged 50 to 59 using combined therapy, there was no change in the risk of coronary heart disease, uh, but there was an increased risk of breast cancer for women of all ages who used combined therapy, but not of death from breast cancer. For women of all ages using either intervention, there was less fracture. And for women of all ages using either intervention orally, there was an increased risk of thromboembolic disease and gallbladder disease. So let's look at how to manage risk. Thromboembolic one is obviously the one that springs to mind first. And we need to remember that women in their 50s or from their mid 40s probably have about a one in a thousand risk of developing a thromboembolic disease in a year. And that risk is affected by age by immobilization, by obesity, by smoking, by pregnancy, by a family history of a VTE, uh, by thrombophilias, and by use of the oral contraceptive or oral MHT. But we also know if we use transdermal estrogen, that risk is not increased. This is Marianne Canonico's data from 2007. On the left, as you look at it, the increased risk seen with oral estrogens and then second from the left, no increased risk for those who use transdermal estrogen. This study also showed that if you use natural progesterone or didrogesterone with transdermal estrogen, the risk remained normal, neutral, not increased. But with some progestogens, particularly norpregnane derivatives, the risk did go up even if you use transdermal estrogen. And then secondly, breast cancer risk and this is very recent data published just last year by the Oxford group, Jana Vinogradova, Carol Copeland, and Julia Hippersley Cox, looking at 98,611 women with a primary diagnosis of breast cancer and nearly 500,000 controls. And they found that for women who used estrogen only, there was no increased risk of breast cancer for up to five years. And I can tell you, even with a massive observational study like this, the confidence that you could have that it was really increased to a relative risk of 1.1 beyond that time frame is weak, probably no change at all. But they did show that for women using combined therapy, there was an increased risk of breast cancer, which was related to both the duration of therapy and to the choice of progestogen. And if you look down the bottom, you can see for estrogen with didrogesterone, for at least four years, there was no increase in the risk of breast cancer. So our current recommendations based on the Women's Health Initiative data that I've just related to you, are that the principal indication remains the alleviation of troublesome menopausal symptoms, that MHT should be part of an overall strategy aimed at improving the overall health of women at midlife and beyond, that systemic MHT has an acceptable safety profile and that benefits are greatest and risks are least when initiated within 10 years of the final menstrual period. Recent data suggests the use of body identical transdermal estrogen and progestogen may offer the most favorable risk to benefit profile. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. But remember, MHT should not be prescribed as primary or secondary prevention of coronary heart disease and should not, in my opinion, be prescribed for women who have had breast cancer.
So we really haven't come too far at all from that revised global consensus statement. And I would commend it to you as a useful and up-to-date guide on the management of women requiring MHT. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you very much, uh, Rodney, for that excellent uh, lecture. As this is a plenary, there will be no questions. We'll stop this session and I'd like to pass it on to the next session, which is chaired by Professor Lim Pei Shan. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Symposium 3, which entitled Sexual Health and the Pelvic Floor. The first two lectures will be given by Puan Aliza Hani Binti Ali Kalam. She is a senior woman health physiotherapist at Vibrance Pelvic Health Center, Malaysia. After completed her Bachelor of Physiotherapy and Clinical Training at the Women Health Physiotherapy Department, Pusat Perubatan UKM, she joined Vibrance Pelvic Care Center Malaysia to pursue her passion in helping individuals with pelvic health issues. She is also trained in supporting women to overcome virginism, and also she had completed women and men health rehabilitation management course in Masha University. Her first talk entitled Pelvic Surgery, Post-Operative Management, Improving Tricky Patient Compliance Challenges. And her second talk will entitle Integrated Therapy Solutions for Virginism, Urinary Incontinence and Chronic Pelvic Challenges. Please welcome one Aliza Hani. Hi everyone, my name is Hani and I'm working as public floor physiotherapist at Vibrance, a rehab center at Italy. Today, I'm going to talk on how to improve tricky patient compliance challenges, especially for post-public surgery cases. 
Before I go into the topic, let me share what usually I do day to day basis. As public floor physio, I help patients that have bladder and bowel challenges such as funerary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic open prolapse, diversity recti, and also provide rehab for pre and post op pelvic surgery. At our center, we have public floor physiotherapists and sexologists. We work together to help patients that have sexual health challenges such as vaginismus and dyspareunia. We are a specialist public health rehab center with the aim to support doctors and patients to overcome public dysfunction. Here, doctors, have you experienced situation where the surgical procedure with the hysterectomy or same procedure went perfectly, but due to the poor rehab with the low compliance or insufficient rehab availability, regression of the clinical condition offered. What well, is that mean? As for example, doctor usually prescribe Kegel exercise to patient, so patient can practice after hysterectomy procedure. But I, I truly understand that not all patients will comply, or maybe they have too low compliance or motivation. And after one or two months, they come again and visit you again at the clinic and claim, doctor, I have you really keen now. I know this compliance issue is quite common and challenging for both doctors and patients. I try to also understand the situation from patient perspective where patients may not understand the importance of rehab or maybe with regards to women's health, specialized and comprehensive service is often not available. For doctors, the most frustrating part is getting patient complaint or blame when we know that from clinical standpoint, we did all that we could, but they just don't understand. They have a role to play in their own recovery. Today, I am going to share some ideas to overcome this problem. As mentioned by Prof, I will cover two topics today. They are both related in the sense that I will be exploring two different areas where we as women health physio can work together with you to deliver superior clinical outcome to your patient. For my first topic, we will explore what we can do together to lock in the benefits of the surgical procedure and reduce post-surgical complication or regression with the aim to increase patient clinical outcome, patient quality of life, and minimize patient complaint by improving their compliance level. We know that quality healthcare outcomes depend upon patient adherence to recommended treatment regimens. However, regarding to the research, more than 40% of patients sustain significant risk by misunderstanding, forgetting, or ignoring healthcare advice. And also supported by another study that approximately 50% of patients with chronic disease do not obtain clinical benefit, do not obtain optimal clinical benefit from treatment because of poor compliance with, medica with medication regimens. Move to the real story at hospital or maybe at your clinic setting, which I trust you may probably see this happen so many times of this problem in your practice. Patient come to you with complaint when it's already too late and surgery is the only option at that time. Then post-op still need to take care of their post-surgery outcome. For example, look at the comment. Even after the surgery, doctor still passionate and concerned to his patient. But this patient may not be a blah. Okay, from my experience working doc with doctor, here is simple post-op checklist. After public surgery, doctors still need to take care of their post-surgery satisfaction and long-term outcome in order to avoid relapse or resurgery. And maybe doctor also need to manage patient complaint that the surgical intervention maybe didn't come out as expected, especially when the patient don't understand even though the real issue is post-surgical rehab and their compliance. Then they blame the procedure or treatment and it's very unfair situation that also may affect some reputational for certain case if not managed well. Okay, let's go back to the root cause and discuss why it's so hard to get patient complied. The first one, the patient's expectation. Okay, in my experience when dealing with doctor referral and our own post-op uh, patient, this is their common expectation. This is just our own study, our own observation that more than 50% of our patients thought that after post hysterectomy, prolapse repair or other pelvic surgery, they obtain last lasting recovery of their symptom or problem are, uh, can be entirely reversed and they didn't bother to get post-surgery rehab even though it has been recommended by doctors. They prone to go back to, to their old lifestyle 
old habits. And I found there is a gap in this clinical situation that we can improve. Based on the referral patient I treated and surveyed informally, they informed that they have been asked to do Kegel exercise after post-surgery. Doctor did such a great job in prescribing Otella specific exercise to the patient. However, I found that not all patients have much understanding about the rehab and the importance of it. For non-proactive patients, they tend to just ignore the advice, but for certain educated and proactive patients that want to continue with post-op maintenance care, they didn't know how to start or if they practice it correctly at home. Here I want to share some important statistics on Kegel exercise. Only 30% of women who try to do Kegel exercise do it correctly. And what happened for remaining 70%? They may have zero result, zero effect, or they can even worsen the condition by using incorrect muscle or invite others' clinical problem. Here is our job to close the gap. I trust with clear and effective communication between health professional and patient, and then we show them the clear pathway to optimizing their public health recovery. Let them know that there is a place, there is a place that they can learn and get clinical guidance in doing Kegel exercise and public floor training. And I trust when all of us emphasize on the importance of post-surgery rehab to the patient, this will make them involved and take charge on their post-op phase. I need to quote this. Patients who feel that their physician communicate well with them and actively encourage them to be involved in their own care, uh, in their own care tend to be more motivated to adhere. I have a post hysterectomy patient that uh, that been referred by gynae. She told us and also updated her gynae too that she was contented and we more confident to do public floor training at our center rather than just placing which muscle to contract at home. Her public floor currently is in the best condition and come was and just come on its mind just for maintenance. The next factor that will affect the level of compliance is patient may say. I don't see the benefit and improvement, therefore I don't see a point of doing it. The first thing that comes to mind for post-surgical rehab is very understandably the in-house rehab center. Makes sense, right? Same building, same patient management system, and it would be great if the outcome are alright. However, by now, I think many of us in this room have experienced the issue of patient drop-off or complaint about the post-surgical rehab experience. The thing is, the in-house team have to do so much with so little. I truly understand your, your in-house physio may be more occupied with more general or more critical cases such as neuro, spot injury, musculoskeletal, and pediatrics. The space must be shared with many patients. If they are lucky, then they can have some small room of a woman's help. But if not, it's just a bed with curtains. In my many visit to hospital and physio department also, majority of the physio are not trained in pelvic floor, in performing pelvic floor intervention. Some are under, under equipped to do it, or some are not comfortable or confident enough to do vaginal examination before getting certification as a pelvic floor physio. That is why some of the patients referred were unable to get the necessary result or improvement even after multiple sessions because the whole plan of treatment not targeting the correct and specific muscle. Hence, when they don't see any significant changes and less trust with the physician, a lot of times their compliance drops. Researchers also stated that patient trust in their position Patient trust in their physician is essential to their emotional disclosure and is therefore a crucial component of the patient-physician relationship. And patient must believe that their physician is someone who can understand their experience, especially someone who can provide them with advice and someone have more experience and skillful in managing their condition. What I want to highlight is we, as public physical therapists, have time to invest, have plenty of time to build patient trust and motivation, and most importantly, we have more experience in managing public for dysfunction cases. Women's heart rehab is more tedious because the main muscle we work with, the pelvic floor muscle and core muscle, are internal to the body. We need to spend time with them, sometimes we need to get them with uh, intravaginal modalities, and so on. If we don't help them get it to get it right, then for sure the benefits of the surgical procedure will not be fully realized. That is why we have set up this specialized center just to do women's rehab. 
We have successfully helped many patients who had really keen of the hysterectomy, completely reverse symptom of stress and incontinence, improving patient with pelvic open prolapse, and conceiving after get vaginismus treatment. Another reason that could contribute on patient compliance is quality of care. The first will be the length of the treatment session. The second one is the frequency of the treatment session. We can neglect that the fact uh, we can neglect the fact that time spent for each therapy or each uh, treatment session is just 15 or 30 minutes or maybe less than that per patient in general physiotherapy department. And we also truly understand due to the time constraint and long queue of patients makes the time spending with them lesser. Even some of my clients, uh, even some of my patients were surprised that, way, that when they got one hour close supervision and guidance when they do public for muscle training with me, because usually at their old physio center, they will love by therapies to practice by themselves or they just put some hot pack or electrical stimulation and done. And not just that, my patient also shared their experience that waiting time for next treatment visit can up to one or two months. This is the reality. The reason I share this real situation is because we're able to improve this level of care, especially for post-surgery rehab management. Based on our practice, we have patients that come once a week and once a month. Of course, a lot of confounding factors uh, that can affect a patient recovery period. However, we found that mostly patients who come frequently to our center to do rehab show significantly faster improvement and higher compliance rate. It also greatly helps to improve patient clinical outcome. To be true, but with floor muscle rehab, it's not just giggle, it's not just snarman commode. We do more than that. We can do digital vaginal examination. We do pelvic floor muscle ultrasound scanning. We do body feedback therapy. We do electrical stimulation therapy, bladder training, core muscle strengthening, and also giving lifestyle advices. This is just for pelvic floor weakness. We also do provide customized rehab plan for hypertone or overactive pelvic floor muscle. This is our specialty always personalize our treatment plan to follow, uh, follow the patient condition. Okay, the last one, the last factor that kept, could affect compliance rate, Kegel is complicated to teach Angel. We all know Kegel and pelvic floor training works, but, but it's so troublesome or hard to make patients to get it. We truly understand it, and after doing it for three years now, we have our own pelvic floor rehab protocol that is proven to improve patient clinical outcome holistically. We specialize in making pelvic floor muscle training visible, palpable, and tangible with our experience with hundreds of women. As you can see the right picture, that's, that is the result of the 30 days of pelvic floor, uh, pelvic floor being exercised correctly, more toned and more stronger. As we equip with the latest and modern EMG machine, and we have our own Kegel trainer, core vibrant pelvic trainer at our center here, Generally, uh, typically, general physio may just use verbal instruction to teach Kegel exercise or use modalities that maybe have passive or no active engagement of pelvic floor muscle, or sometimes unable to give physical guidance since no time or short-handed. It is entirely different at Vibrance. We use evidence-based intervention while proactively guiding and providing one-to-one -one intervention and coaching with a great success and recovery repeatedly that can ensure your patient satisfaction and improve clinical outcome. Over the years of working and partnering with doctors, we have learned and developed simple ways to process and handle the aspect of referral when it comes to post-surgery with our partner doctors. I already talked on what we do to work with you to lock in the benefit of the surgical intervention for pelvic dysfunction. Before I continue with the second tricky situation with patient, if you have post-op cases coming soon or previous post-op uh, post patient that you think can still benefit from improved compliance and rehab result, kindly can you refer them to me. Come find me at the Vibrance. Let me assist your patient by optimizing their rehabilitation and their recovery journey. Here is our care line number. You can contact us and refer your patients starting today. We open every day from 8 to 9 p.m. And I really can't wait to give the best and professional rehab for, to your patient. Hope you enjoy the uh, part one of my, of my sharing and found it useful for you and your patient. Next up, I will share how we can take the partnering integrated approach to the next level, not just for post-surgery cases, but also for common chronic pelvic floor condition, such as vaginismus, urinary incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, stay tuned and thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the session. The second aspect that I would like to cover with you today is also on an area that we understand many doctors struggle to find good solution for chronic pelvic dysfunction such as progenismus, urinary incontinence and management of pelvic organ prolapse. I will be talking about on how we can work together to achieve good outcome for these chronic pelvic floor dysfunction cases that I know many of you find a bit more tedious to handle because of the need to deliver therapy over a long period of time as opposed to medical or surgical intervention. Basically, with our specialized women's public health service, now you have an, you have an ideal solution to offer to this category of patients. By now, we understand the frustration both from the patient and doctor's perspective for conditions such as vaginismus. I'm sure all of you today are amazing doctors who would never do this, but we have had vaginismus patients telling, telling us that their doctors tried to force them to do pelvic examination even though they were in so much fear and pain. And we also understand your perspective. If you cannot even examine the patient, how are you going to treat the patient at all and what to do? And a few of my patients also shared their story and experience when they went for their first visit for vaginismus consultation Doctor asked them just use lidocaine cream every time you want to do intercourse or just get cramp. Even the couple just surprised with the suggestion. I also have heard from my patient that the normalization to have mild UV prolapse, vaginal prolapse after vaginal birth, and should not be the main concern for mommy. This is so. This is also frustrating to hear as health practitioner that almost every day dealing with pelvic floor case. But I know all of you here today are definitely not like that. It's just that there are some people uh, out there like that. So if you meet them, please do share with them that there are better solutions available nowadays. Happily, today we have a solution that I will share with you, which is how we help this patient. Before I continue further, I want to share the latest guideline from National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. They highly recommend and suggest for combining different health professions or specialties to work together to provide an effective and comprehensive service delivery for public health. At Vibrance, we have witnessed the efficacy and significant benefit from the combination or integrative approach that involve urogyne, colorectal, ONG, sexual therapies, and us as public floor physio in treating public floor dysfunction cases. In the earliest days when we started to test out doing integrative management with doctors, patients came to me by referral from SGMC with diagnosis of third degree of uterus prolapse. Patient is advised to wear passenger ring for her condition. However, she personally didn't like the idea of wearing something inside. Happen a lot of the, happens a lot of the time, right? Doctor prescribed, but patient not obedient. Her doctor took note of this and mentioned to try rehab with vibrance. So she was very motivated to go for public floor rehab. When she came, I started her course of public floor muscle training, advised her on lifestyle and body weight management, and 100% supervised Kegel training program. It took about three months of consistent and disciplined rehab training. Surprisingly, in the latter follow-up, doctor announced that her product stage has improved, pelvic floor muscle strength increased, no need to wear passadori, and just continue with pelvic floor maintenance. relief and sense of achievement all together on progress patient pace. And this kind of improved patient outcome is what I would say this is one of the biggest achievements of doing integrated management. We trust by doing the integrated approach also will ensure the continuity of care that will meet patient satisfaction and ultimately result in an effective treatment solution. We also got vaginismus and dyspareunia cases from doctors. This one is a little bit of accidental discovery. We were using the physical treatment approach when we, when we first started, but very soon we were taught by patient when they begin to plateau and display psychological uh, and display psychological barrier as well when.
introduce our patient to see our sexologist as part of our treatment. And we find that, that has, uh, it has drastically improved the outcome and process by overcoming a large part of resistance coming from psychological factors. The cognitive behavior therapy. And now we have been using this combined treatment approach to high success rate combining physical and sexual therapy in treating sexual dysfunction case. Instead of going straight to dilators or drugs to very, to very supportive and encouraging result with 80% successful first vaginal penetration, patient was happy because can get two different therapy services at one place and most importantly, they achieved their goal for penis and vagina or conceive. That's a very, very rewarding journey for both the patient and us as practitioner. What makes the difference? I would say that it all comes from the fact that we specialize in this field because we specialize in it, our training, our people, our setup, our equipment, the time we spend is all perfectly optimized to achieve the, uh, to achieve the desired outcome for the patient suffering from chronic pelvic dysfunction that can be effectively treated or managed by integrated rehab modalities. What we aim to do is to partner with your doctors who are the patient primary caregivers to provide high quality rehab to your patient after the surgery or after you advise them to do Kegels. By sending them to us, we can ensure that your patient receive best in class clinically proven private for rehab that can improve patient clinical outcome and improve quality of life. By working with us, doctor, you can expect better long-term outcome for pelvic for dysfunction cases and improve patient satisfaction, giving a clinical proven conservative option to patients that have high anxiety towards surgical intervention and its complication or risk, and ability to offer an effective long-term solution for bladder and sexual dysfunction cases. For simple, straightforward pelvic floor cases, we will use our in-house protocol to identify the challenges that the patient has in correctly doing her kegels and use our expertise, especially pelvic floor physiotherapists, together with the latest pelvic floor rehab equipment to get the patient on doing correct kegels. For complicated cases where you have specific focus or goal for the patient rehab, for example, you would like your patient to achieve certain level of muscle function in specific muscle group. We can work together. We can work in close communication with you to deliver the result for the patient. Depending on your requirement, we do send the patient's report and all the updates and progression to you periodically so that you can also monitor the outcome. Best of all, we also send patient back to you to uh, we, uh, patient back to you for revisit and further checkup. For, to ensure patient of outcome is objectively improving. So far, this collaboration has helped us achieve both subjective and objective improvement for patient with a high success, uh, high success and compliance rate. Okay? Our practice is evidence-based and all our protocols are based on the latest peer-reviewed clinical research presented at ICS, IUGA, OGSM, and UGS. Our team are all certified physiotherapists and sexologists. We do not practice any alternative medicine. Our clinical results are in line with established medical findings. And most importantly, complete cure consistently achieved for uh, stress urinary incontinence and tangible progress on clinical measures for vaginism. Here are the areas of our practice that we specialize in and can definitely help your patient to achieve an op uh, to achieve the optimal and long-lasting clinical result. We can do post-op management for any pelvic region surgery, pelvic organ prolapse management, uh, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, chronic pelvic pain, and last but not least, the most high demand cases for now at our center is vaginismus. To sum up in three years of practicing,